Hi everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Katie Starr and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage marketing team. Stanley Premium Western Forage is a family-owned business located in southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're here to serve you and your animals with consistent, high-quality nutrition and valuable education to keep them happy and healthy. Welcome to our educational webinar titled Spring into Action, What to Watch Out for, Metabolic Disease Prevention and Management. Lush spring grass is so enticing for our horses this time of year, but don't let seasonal changes increase the risk of metabolic issues. Proper forage management can help minimize those risks as well um, as we will learn more today. If you happen to be new to joining our webinars, we'll take just a minute to go over a few items so you are comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. If you're viewing this as a recording, feel free to skip over this section. As a heads up, we will have a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause the presentation for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you'll want to stay with us till the end. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with the white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime you'd like during the presentation. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will also have an opportunity to submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation today. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Depending on how many questions that come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame, but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We have also attached a couple of nutritional papers associated with today's webinar that you can download from the control panel under handouts. For those viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and nutritional resources to find the handouts that are titled Carbohydrates in Horses, What Do I Need to Know? and Low Carb Forage Options. These are both great take home pieces for this webinar. And that's all I have from an introductory standpoint. So please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage Equine Nutritionists. She has a PhD in Equine Nutrition and Reproduction. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share just a little more about herself before she begins the presentation. Thank you, Katie, and thank you all for joining in our webinar, webinar this evening. Um, as Katie mentioned, I work with Performance Horse Nutrition. We are a consulting nutrition group with Stanley Hay Company. We really value Stanley as a client because we fully understand that forage is the most important part of a horse's diet. A little bit about my background. I'm originally from Australia, but I recently became an American citizen. Um, so you're listening to a newly minted American. With that, we will get started. Um, First, we're going to talk about forage carbohydrates. I want to set the scene. What we're concerned most about this time of year are those sugars and starches. So what are they? Where are they coming from? Uh, when the plant grows, how are those carbohydrates being utilized or not being utilized or being stored? Some different forage types, because I know that you all have questions about different forage choices for your metabolic courses. We'll briefly touch on some of those disorders, but touch on more some of those signs that we should be concerned about this time of year, and then also how to manage that forage. We always encourage a lot of questions 
you can type them in throughout and Katie will see them or you can ask them at the end. So let's start with forage carbohydrates. Let's break down that plant, break it down into two major sections. If you go to the right, we've got those structural carbohydrates. That's the cell wall. That's what holds the plant up. So our first cutting hay, for example, stands a little taller as we have uh, wetter weather and it's a little harder to get out into those fields, that plant stands taller. There is structure holding that plant up, that cell wall, which is the fibrous part of um, that plant. That's the fibrous carbohydrates. Horse absolutely needs those structural carbohydrates in its diet. If we go to the left-hand side of this diagram though, now we look in the blue at those non-structural carbohydrates. That's the cell contents, which gets broken down into two different types of sugars and some starch. So we've got our water soluble carbohydrates, our ethanol soluble carbohydrates and our starch. Let's look a little bit more in detail at these water soluble and ethanol soluble carbohydrates. If we break these out into two groups, our ethanol soluble carbohydrates simply mean simple sugars. If you add then a sugar fraction called fructans, to the simple sugars, that is water soluble carbohydrates. If we take the water soluble carbohydrates and the starch, add those two together, that's what we consider non structural carbohydrates. And if we've got a metabolic course and our veterinarian or our nutritionist says we need to keep those non structural carbs at less than 10% of the horse's total diet, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about this water soluble fraction and the starch combined. Not just the starch, not just the sugar, but this fraction combined. Where are we going to see these? Well, your sugars, your simple sugars and your fructan, so your water soluble, your ethanol soluble and your that fructan that's in there, that is what is going to be produced by cool season grasses. Our cool season grasses, their primary energy storage unit are those sugars and fructan. Our starches, as we all know, our cereal grains like corn, oats, barley, they're going to be primarily making starch, but also our legumes like alfalfa, that its primary storage unit is starch, and our warm season grasses, they store their energy as starch. But we have to remember that in legumes and warm season grasses, that storage of starch is self-limiting. Think about it like a gas tank in a car. There's only so much room for that plant to accumulate starch before it has to use it up. And it can't accumulate any more when that gas tank is full, unlike your sugars uh, and starches, sugars and fructans, which can be um, stored as long as the sun is shining. So you've heard me talk about cool and warm season grasses. Well, maybe in your area of the country or whatever you're reading, you may have been more familiar with C3 and C4 grasses. C3, cool season, C4, warm season. If you look at the chart here in the middle, this is really the best way to describe these grasses. Your cool season grasses have active growing periods in the spring and in the fall. Your warm season grasses have their active growing period in the summer. What would consist of your cool season grasses, your Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, Timothy grass, fescue, your warm season grasses, your Bermuda, crabgrass, teff, bluestem. These are just a few examples. Now also within these grass species, we have perennials and annuals. So perennials means those plants come back every year. So a warm season perennial would be Bermuda grass, a cool season perennial, orchard or timothy. A warm season annual, which means you've got to sow that seed every year, is your teff grass or your cool season oat or annual rye. If you look at this graphic of the United States, we see obviously most of our cool season grasses are going to be in the northern states predominantly, warm season grasses in the southern states. But then if you live along this middle zone, you'll notice when you either grow lawn seed or pasture mixes, you're going to have a mix of cool and warm season grasses so that you're always got a nice stand of grass either in your lawn or in your fields. So as I mentioned, the carbohydrate um, 
composition, storage of C3 and C4 grasses is different. Um, those C4 grasses, the warm season grasses, should have average lower in non-structural carbohydrates than most C3 or cool season grasses because those C4s do not have the ability to form that long chain fructan. C4 grasses form starch as their storage carbohydrate. The other thing that I want you to take notice of, on the left-hand side, just look at this graphic of the, the cell wall of the um, C3 plants, C3 plants in the leaf and in the stem, you'll notice what I mainly want you to see here is there's a lot of open space in there. It's not tightly packed. C3 grasses are typically more digestible because they're not as tightly packed in their biochemical makeup. Now look at the C4 plant. Much more structure, much more tightly packed. C4 or warm season grasses tend to be a little less digestible compared to C3 grasses. And you can see here why, because they're so tightly packed. So let's go on and look at plant growth. We've talked about the different types of plant, but then even within plants, within plant species, we're going to have variation based on certain environmental conditions. So during the day, the sun shines on the plant, photosynthesis occurs, and that plant is either going to store sugar, fructan, or starches, depending on the type of plant that it is throughout the day. Then at night, when the sun goes away, we are going to have plant growth if. If there's enough moisture in the soil, if the temperature in the soil and in the air is ideal, if there's enough nutrients in the soil, then we're going to have plant growth. Now, some of you, if you've got a laminitic course, you may have heard, well, first thing in the morning, um, after a frosty night, we can't turn our horses out. That's correct because the air temperature was too cool to allow for that active plant growth. So think about this also. If you've got sunny days and fast growing grasses, we're going to have lower sugar content in those cool season grasses. Sunny days and slow growth, Maybe we're in a drought, maybe there's not a lot of fertilizer in the soil or the nights are cool. That was going to mean higher sugar accumulation because growth means using energy. In any animal, plant, whatever, as you grow, you use energy. Um, so we want actively growing plants. I want to point out, I, I point this out a lot, but I really want to point out that at the facility in Idaho where Stanley grows their forages, it is a very scientific operation. They're doing soil tests on individual fields so they know exactly what nutrients to replace. That's It's not a blanket, let's kind of fertilize all fields the same generically. They're also irrigating exactly when those plants need it and with the amounts of water that are ideal. They're harvesting at the correct plant height, you aren't going to see a more scientific operation when it comes to growing these forages. And that is really, really critical because the quality of that grass, the nutrient content of that forage can change if you don't um, adequately fertilize or, you know, water the plants and harvest at the right time. So they're going to grow these plants really well. Then they're going to harvest them. If you can harvest early in the morning, then we have the least amount of sugars and starches, lower non-structural carbohydrates. Um, but then what I want to go to is you grow a great plant, you bale it exactly when you should, and it's nice and dry, then it comes to storage. This was some work um, done where they looked at different storage methods of forages. Now you can see here, if we keep that forage, that hay, on bare ground where it's able to wick up that moisture out of the ground and no cover on it, we're going to get about 30% dry matter and nutrient loss 
on gravel, which is at least better than on that brayer ground, but still no cover, around 25% nutrient loss. So you can see light is not good for this forage. Bare ground, but under a tarp, now we're right down around 13%. So this is good. We're able to keep that forage dry. On gravel and under a tarp, or inside buildings, which you can see, these are Stanley storage facilities. We've got between five and 9% nutrient loss compared to most operations where they're putting the hay outside at 30%. So um, the consistency of the product is absolutely critical. You know when you have a performance horse or a sick horse suffering from some kind of metabolic disorder, that consistency is absolutely critical. You really don't have a lot of room for error. So I want to point out that Stanley Forage products are very consistent. I'm going to turn it over to Katie for our first poll question. Thank you, Dr. Cubit. So our first polling question is, what type of forage or hay do you feed your horse? And the options are alfalfa, timothy grass, orchard grass, teff grass, and Bermuda grass. If you don't happen to, is sometimes we feed mixes of grasses and things like that. Uh, these are the ones that we went ahead and decided to go with. So please um, make the best selection that you can. You are able to choose more than one, so please feel free to do that. Um, and then click submit when you are finished. Okay, it looks like about 80% of you have, have voted, so we'll wait just a few more moments uh, before we close the poll. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the poll now. And I'd like to share it with everyone. And Dr. Cubit, we have... We have 56% on today uh, feed alfalfa, 50% feed Timothy, 47% feed Orchard, 3% feed Teff, and 24% feed Bermuda. Excellent. That's great information as we go forward. So let's look at some different forage types. So we've just asked all the different types of forages. So you can see from that question, there are a wide variety of different forages out there that people can choose from. So let's kind of go through them all and give you a little bit more information about each one. So typical alfalfa forage is going to be high in protein, high in energy. So when I say it's high in protein, and it's high in good quality protein, that means it's high in those amino acids like lysine. If your horse bucked you off when you fed it alfalfa, it is because it's higher in energy and it's nothing to do with the protein. So protein is really good. Um, it's high in calcium, moderate phosphorus, moderate fiber. It's really quite digestible. It's low in your sugars, because remember, it's a legume and it stores its energy it's, as starch, but it's also self-limiting. Remember, it can only store a certain amount of starch, so it's pretty low in starch as well. It's a legume and it's a perennial. It'll come back every year. It also puts a lot of nitrogen into the soil. That's a natural fertilizer, so it's really good for the environment when we grow alfalfa. Um, which horses would I feed this to? I get this question quite a bit. If I have a thinner horse that suffers from metabolic issues, or we've got a performance horse that maybe has sugar sensitivities like uh, PSSM or tying up, then I am going to feed alfalfa because it's low in sugars and starches, but it's going to give me additional calories and protein for um, exercise, performance, and for weight gain. I would not feed alfalfa to a fat horse with metabolic syndrome. It's just got too many calories. So if we look at Timothy grass, we've got moderate protein, moderate energy, low calcium and phosphorus. But, but I really want to go back and point out that when we get to our Timothy and our different grasses, depending on the grower, these bullet points that I've got here can be very variable. We can have very low protein in Timothy grass if it's not grown under ideal conditions or there's not enough fertilization in the soil, etc. 
moderate energy. Now, energy is also going to be dictated by amount of fiber. So if we're cutting this forage really late and we've got a lot of seed heads like you can see in the picture, then our energy content is going to be lower. Uh, lower in calcium and phosphorus, much higher in fiber. Um, low starch because it doesn't store its energy as starch, but it stores its energy as sugars, the WSC and ESC being a subset of WSC. It's a cool season forage and it's a perennial. It'll also come back. Now, your orchard grass is similar um, to your Timothy, but slightly higher in nutritional value. It's a cool season as well, and it's also a perennial. It will come back. So, again, if you have a good grower that's consistent, that uses science in their fields and their technology, then these, you know, you're going to have moderate protein and energy and <clears throat> moderate to high fiber. Now, let's talk about Bermuda grass. Uh, when you all signed in, you were able to ask questions that you might like to see during the presentation. And uh, one of them, well, what about coastal? What about Bermuda grass? What about TEF? So Bermuda, coastal is actually a variety of, excuse me, of Bermuda grass. Um, we actually have three different groupings of Bermuda grass. We've got seeded, improved, and hybrids. It's a warm season grass. It was originally used a lot in lawn grass mixes, um, but and it's a perennial. It'll come back every year. Um, we've got this common seeded. The, when you think about Bermuda grasses, a lot of times it gets a bit of a bad reputation. Really, the poorer quality Bermuda grass is the common Bermuda grass, otherwise sometimes known as wire grass. And we have this other variety called giant leaf Bermuda grass, and it is similar to common. Um, it's a seeded variety. Then we have these improved <clears throat> seeded varieties, and they're usually a cross of coastal and a more winter hardy variety. Coastal. Um, is de developed really as a very warm, grows in very warm, sandy climates, and it's a hybrid. Um, there are several other different hybrids. We've got two different types of Tiftons, Midland, Ozark. Now, these are just a few. There are a, a, a multitude of other different hybrids, but um, coastal Bermuda grass, its leaves are a little bit more sharply angled to the stem. This is a picture of uh, coastal. Profu provides uh, much less seed head than the common Bermuda grass, um, and the seeds are sterile. That's why it's a hybrid, not a seed head. It grows in the sandy soil, and it's got very, very deep roots because growing in the sandy soil, you really need to get right down through that sand to get into um, the moisture. It's a cross between that common and an introduced species from South Africa. You can see from our graphic, if we remember before, we we're talking about cool and season. It's a warm season. It really proliferates well in our July, August periods. As far as nutritional value, being that it is a warm season grass, it's going to have similar nutritional content as far as protein and energy to your Timothy. But again, if grown under less than ideal circumstances, it can have much higher fiber content. And depending on the variety of Bermuda grass, it can have much higher fiber content, non-digestible fiber that can be a little concerning when it comes to um, impaction colic. So we wanna steer clear of those common varieties and go more with your improved or hybrid varieties. I have seen as low as six or 7% um, protein contents in your common varieties up to around 14% crude protein in your improved and hybrid. So again, it all comes back to the grower. Now I'll talk about teff. Teff grass is a new forage. It's actually native to Ethiopia. You'll notice from our picture here, it has very fine stems in relation to other um, forages that are available. It's new to America as a horse forage. It's a warm season and it's an annual. Um, so it's gonna, you're gonna have to plant this every year. Now it's actually a really good crop to grow after alfalfa because alfalfa puts fertilization in the soil and then 
you can use very little resources to grow TEF nicely afterwards. Moderate protein and energy, again, very similar to your Timothy, um, can have quite high fiber if not harvested at the right time and if the soil and environmental conditions are not ideal. Again, it goes back to the consistency and the quality of that grower. Low starch because it's self-limiting, it's a C4, so it stores its energy at starch um, and low to moderate sugar content. Some other varieties that aren't necessarily mainstream as far as hay varieties, but we're getting more and more. Um, and there's a lot of groups actually doing research on these because they're native, so they grow well in certain areas, but because they're worn season grasses, they also are fairly low in sugars and starches. Here's your squitch grass, little big blue stem, Indian grass, broom sedge, side oats, gramma, and eastern gamma grass. These are different varieties that you may see in your area. So we have one more poll question. Thank you. And so our second polling question is, what metabolic disease are you most concerned with? And the options we have to choose from are crusty neck, insulin resistance, laminitis, or PPID, Cushing syndrome. Okay, it looks like about 70% of you have answered. If you haven't had a chance to answer yet, please go ahead and select your answer and submit, and then we'll close the poll soon. Okay, it looks like we've got most of you, so I'm going to close the poll and share it with everyone. So... We have the biggest concern for attendees today, 53% uh, said laminitis. Uh, second is insulin resistance at 24%. Third is uh, Cushing syndrome at 15% and 9% for crusty neck. Okay, so I want that 9% of you that said you were concerned about Cresty Next to give yourselves a pat on the back. And why do I want you to do that? Because this is the precursor to everything else. That Cresty Neck, we know, is an indicator of your horse's risk for metabolic syndrome. This was some research that myself and some other graduate students did, and we looked at lots of different horses and we developed this crusty neck scoring system but as you can see from this little pony on the right both ponies are fat the one on the right has a crusty neck the one on the left does not all ponies that look like this typical one on the right plagued with metabolic issues the one on the left very rarely got metabolic issues so we developed this crusty neck scoring system very much like your body condition scoring system um, one through th zero through three really is fine. We've got a zero that you're going to see an upside down kind of U type neck. You're going to see that in thinner, older horses, rescue horses. Anywhere from a one to a three, we've got either one where we've got flat, really no crest, but that horse is just that maybe a thoroughbred. Two, we've got slight rise here in the crest and number three there's definitely a crest there but if you put your hand over it it's not very wide but when we go to the four and the five I struggle to get my hand around this little guy's neck <clears throat> there's creases you can see fat dimples <clears throat> and then here on number five now yes that is a stallion you say well stallions have big crests but what I wanted to point out is yes we have to take that into account but we can see huge creases in this guy's neck this there's a lot of fat here um, so a four and a five if your horse's crest looks anything like that of that size if you put your hand over it it's quite wide these are risk factors for your horse going on to develop insulin resistance that which is you know often a precursor to laminitis so this is what you should be concerned about right now if all you're concerned about is laminitis we may be missing the boat a little bit so what is insulin resistance and i've kind of put them in order of um their occurrence insulin resistance well let's go back to what is insulin it's a hormone secreted by the pancreas that controls blood glucose so it shunts glucose around out of the blood into the muscle etc it's very important for 
life in general. Insulin resistance though, those tissues, those little channels don't respond. Insulin doesn't work, so it can't shunt glucose around. Um, and from that, we get a whole slew of other problems occurring, one of those being laminitis. Um, you also will notice a lot of times these abnormal fatty deposits. And sometimes you have skinny ribs and you have these big fat pads over the hind quarter and over the, um, the crusty neck. And people say, well, my horse is thin, but really he's got these gross fat pads. And so um, it's very important to be looking out for those fat pads. That usually is a precursor to laminitis. Now, obviously, laminitis has a thousand and one different causes, but when it comes to nutritional laminitis, oftentimes, or um, it, that is related to metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance usually comes first. We've got a nice healthy hoof here where the coffin bone is sitting nicely in alignment with the hoof wall. As we get acute laminitis, we have separation of those laminae, those little structures that are holding that coffin bone to the hoof wall. We get inflammation there, hence the word laminitis being inflammation. And then we start to get rotation where we have death of those little structures holding everything together and worst case scenario is if that rotation goes all the way down and we have sinking of that coffin bone and perforation through the sole of the foot. So we really want to avoid that. When looking at all of the different known causes of laminitis, now this isn't all of them, but this is the majority of them. Um, you know, lush pasture around 45%, so this time of year, uh, add that with grain overload, feeding too much of those sugars and starches, and we've got 50% of laminitis is caused by diet. Um, so it's really important that we have consistency and we know exactly what the horses are eating. PPID, otherwise known as Cushing syndrome, it's a tumor on the horse's pituitary gland, which is in the back of the horse's brain, which controls hormone regulation. And we have hormones that are going to sense um, light changes in the season and say, okay, shed your hair coat because we're now in the spring, mares start to cycle, et cetera. But there's a big tumor there, so it interferes with that um, hormone release. And we see these horses that have really curly hair coat. This horse in this image is very um, advanced stage of Cushing's. One thing you will notice in very early stage Cushing's is you might notice there's just wispy hairs right where you would imagine the rain. Let me draw for you. Where you would imagine the rain going from the bit up to your hand, right here on the neck, we start to notice some wispy long hairs. We also notice some discharge out of the horse's nose. Um, maybe we start to see some ulcers in the horse's mouth. These are all very early signs of Cushing's. Um, the horse does not have to have equine metabolic syndrome in order to have PPID. This is classic PPID where he's really thin, uh, drinks a lot, pees a lot, uh, but obviously a lot of our insulin resistant and laminitic horses also end up developing this. So let's talk about forage management. Forage is the most important part of the horse's diet, whether it comes from pasture or hay or hay pellets. Um, but if we are using pasture turnout, if we have land and we want to use pasture turnout, then we really need to be able to restrict this graphic on the bottom. I know that this doesn't look as appealing as a beautiful big grassy field, but um, these dry lots can be the most ideal because we can control everything that's going in that horse's mouth. If you are turning them out to pasture, obviously avoid turning them out after cold nights followed by sunny days. Make sure you're turning them out very early in the morning versus in the afternoon because the sugars are depleted in the morning. Overcast days are good, shaded pastures are good, and also avoid these stress foragers. So on the edge of this paddock where they're nipping at that short grass that isn't growing very well because it doesn't get a lot of water, that's really stressed. It's not growing, so it's really high in sugars and starches. If you can't do that and you want to turn your horses out to grass, use a grazing muzzle. I know some people don't like the look of it, but it will reduce feeding intake. Now, don't be thinking, well, I'll do my horse a favor and I'll put it on in the morning and I'll take it off in the afternoon. No, horses are smart and they will rapidly learn to consume a lot of their forage in the afternoon. So 
Forage is the most important part of the horse's diet. So what does that mean? Well, an absolute bare minimum amount of food that you should feed your horse is 1% of body weight. That works out to be about 10 pounds of forage for that 1,000 pound horse. I very rarely go that low. I, If I have a horse on a weight loss program, I'm typically going to go to about 1.2% of body weight, 12 pounds of forage a day. But our more general recommendation is around 1.5 to 2.5% of body weight, so 15 to 25 pounds of forage. Now people say, well, what would happen if I fed less than 1% of body weight? Um, this was a study done in Europe where they looked at feeding 0.6% of body weight, 1.1% of body weight, about 1.6% of body weight, and their ad lib, so let the horses eat as much as they want, and they worked out to be eating about 2% of body weight. The best quality hay is only 50% digestible. So when you're feeding anywhere from 1.1% to 2% of body weight, the hay was very, di it was digestible at the expected rate in the horse's gut. When they were down here around 0.6% of body weight though, the, the forage was only about 34% digestible in the horse's gut. So what that meant was the gut was failing. Think about the whole gastrointestinal tract is a muscular tube, constantly pushing small amounts of food through the digestive system. The horse is a trickle feeder. He's supposed to be constantly pushing food along. If you break your arm and you put it in a sling for six weeks, what happens? You get muscle atrophy. The exact same thing happens in the gut. If you're not feeding enough forage, we get atrophy of those muscles that are pushing food along, and we actually see cells start to die and slough off the intestinal tract. So make sure you're feeding adequate amounts of forage. I want to point out, we're right near the end here, but I think it's really important to point this out. Every single grouping there, so we've got a standard alfalfa bale, a compressed alfalfa, some alfalfa cubes and some alfalfa chop. Every single one of those weighs four and a half pounds. They all look quite different. One would probably be... Um, mistaken to say, well, this is the most, or this is the most, or, that's really the least. No, they all weigh four and a half pounds. So when it comes to the amount of fiber you're feeding the horse, these are all the same. Obviously, when you're starting to feed hay cubes or pellets, it's lesser volume, so they can consume it faster. And it's all about mimic, gra mimicking grazing behavior. So the less you're feeding, because you maybe horse, have yours on a weight loss program or you're using a lot of pellets, you really have to always remember to mimic grazing behavior, either using slow feeder nets or by using some kind of slow feeder contraption. But always remember, you want to mimic grazing behavior. You want to slowly spread out that forage throughout the day, no matter whether your horse is fat or thin. So decrease the non-structural carbohydrate intake. We want to use low carb forages. Maybe do some forage testing if you need to. Um, grazing at times of the day that are going to decrease your NSC intake. A quality grower provides consistency, and consistency is the key when it comes to metabolic issues. Questions? We went a little over, but I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Cubit, for some great insight into carbohydrates, forage types, and how to minimize metabolic disease risk. Remember to download the nutritional papers available under handouts before we end the webinar tonight. And just a reminder, we will be drawing our winner for free product coupons in just a few minutes following the Q&A session. So please continue to stick around for that. So let's go ahead and get started on a few questions that were submitted during today's presentation. Again, feel free to still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. And Dr. Cubit, our first question is from Carol. And her question, are there specific breeds of horses prone to metabolic issues or strictly a genetic problem? Yes, this is a great question. Absolutely. We know that there are horses that we say have that thrifty genotype. Um, any of your pony breeds or horses that have pony breeds as part of them, your Morgans, Saddlebreds, um, Arabians even can be really easy keepers. Uh, these breeds we know are genetically predisposed. I don't see a lot of issues uh, with the majority of quarter horses, for example. They are easy keepers, but they don't tend to get that big crusty neck. 
but definitely your pony breeds um, are much more at risk. So there is definitely a genetic link. Perfect. And let's see. Lisa asks, is blood work the best way to check for insulin resistance? When it comes to insulin resistance, yes, blood work is the best way to test um, because we don't really have outward symptoms like we do with PPID. I mean, with PPID, if you're starting to see some of those regional hairy spots or they're drinking a lot, peeing a lot, and they're up there in age, you can pretty much guarantee they've got early stage Cushing's. But when it comes to insulin resistance, um, a blood, blood work is the best way. Now, I will say, I had a lady call me just recently, and she said, you know, I have a Morgan, he has a crusty neck, I get his blood work done every year, and up to this point, he's never shown me any signs. And I said, well, it's good that you test him every year because as horses age, their ability to regulate glucose and insulin decreases. Um, so he may be fine, fine, fine. And then one year she tests him and he's not. So just because he's not showing signs of insulin resistant doesn't mean you can feed him a racehorse feed and, you know, not be concerned about uh, spring pastures. You know, he's that type. You know, if he's got a crusty neck, he is more prone to it. Um, and as I said, as they age, everything starts to fail when it comes to glucose and insulin. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. Um, Kristen would like to know, can feeding cinnamon help with Cushing symptoms or metabolic syndrome? Oh, you know, there are a myriad of different herbs and spices that uh, people have tried to feed to horses with metabolic syndrome. And really, the research has not shown that any of them work, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. And let's see, um, Karen would like to know, so if I reduce horse's weight and get the crusty neck to a three or less, will IR be reversed? Oh, well, yes and no. Um, the longer that an animal, human or horse, is overweight and has that crusty neck, the more their normal shifts, their baseline glucose and insulin shifts. So let's just say you get a horse, you, you've rescued a horse or you've gotten a horse and he's always been obese and you're a great owner and you get that weight under control. You can see maybe he's founded once or twice or had some laminitis. He's got some rings on his foot. You get his body weight under control and you really decrease that crest. Do you have, when he's, you know, under control like that, do you ever have to worry about what you feed him or the grass again? Absolutely, yes. Um, he is forever at risk. So less at risk, but he is forever at risk. Okay. Thank you for your question, Karen. Um, and Lynn would like to know, I live in western South Dakota. We have great moisture right now. Grass in pasture is about four or five variety mix. Is that an issue with leaving them out? One has laminitis from winter. Let's say there has been a lot of winter laminitis from so cold and hard ground. Mm. So that winter laminitis is not nutritional, it's mechanical. Um, so it's more that you've, it was so cold out and it was so hard and it really decreased the blood flow to the hooves. Um, and so I would always be cautious because we've had damage to the hoof now it was caused by something else so I would always be cautious if your horses are overweight if they have a crusty neck I would not be allowing them to you know graze all day long maybe I would set up a little sacrifice area or maybe I'll just put a grazing muzzle on them so that they um, weren't consuming as much okay and this is um Kind of similar to a previous question, but um, a little bit different still. Are there certain breeds of horses who have naturally crusty type necks? And that's by that's from Patty. So Patty, I would say if we go back and look at those po pony pictures, it, it's like any animal. It's what we breed for. So there are some ponies 
that have been bred to have that crusty neck because that was a trait that we selected um in a much and it's not i I'm getting at it's not necessarily a muscular neck because that comes if you look at a dressage horse it's got a nice muscular neck from exercise sometimes we're we're selecting the traits for that kind of fatty crusty neck because in the show ring you know sometimes that's desirable so there certainly are those breeds like your Morgans saddlebreds ponies that are more predisposed to having that crusty neck but also within those breeds you can have certain lines certain pedigrees uh, that are more likely to to carry those traits as well okay thank you and we're going to squeeze in one more question um, and Sue would like to know if a 20 year old is overweight, should he be fed Timothy instead of alfalfa? If the, so he's overweight and he's 20, um, at that point, we want to make sure he's got, you know, a couple of things going against him. He's older, so his ability to deal with those sugars and starches is lessened. So finding a low carb senior feed, because it's going to be high in, digestible fiber but low in sugars and starches when it comes to uh, what am I going to feed him I'm probably going to find a Timothy you know if, if you're going to buy a Stanley product we can give you typical uh, carbohydrate analysis but if your horse is actively sick I always recommend people get it tested uh, but I may be looking more towards something like a TEF or a lower carbohydrate forage absolutely for that older horse Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. We really appreciate your time and your interest in wanting to learn more about nutrition for your animals. So before we wrap things up, we're going to go ahead and announce our winner of free product coupons now. And the winner is and um, please forgive me if I do not pronounce your name correctly, but Carol Lukey. So Carol, thank you so much uh, for being on today and congratulations. We will email you to get mailing information for sending out your coupons. Uh, if you have any other questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, please feel free to contact Stanley's customer relations team. The phone number and email are available on this final slide. Dr. Cubitt, if you wouldn't mind skipping over to that. Um, thank you. And you can find past webinars, more nutritional white papers, and other great information, including the Stanley Barn Bulletin blog and some great tools to help identify what type of forage is best for your horse and how to optimize their diet on our website at stanleyforage.com. So when you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would really appreciate it if you could complete that for us. Your feedback really helps us to create better webinars, better education content for you, and helps us to identify some great topics for future webinars that we plan on hosting a little bit later this year. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours or so with a link to view a recording of today's webinar if you'd like to go back and reference it. The recording should be available for a week following the webinar today and then available on our website under nutritional resources, which is where you can also find all of the past webinars that we have done. So on behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubit, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and we hope you have a great rest of your week.